Lord, we just ask you to open this word to us this morning. Sink it deep into our hearts. Speak to us. Lord, I pray that you would have your way with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I want to set the, I want to set the setting today, if you will. I need to, to kind of build a foundation before we jump into the text. So we're going to go back about 33 years. Not 33 years from today. That would be the 90s. We don't want to go there, although the 90s were kind of nice. But we're going to go back 33 years before that first Easter Sunday. That first Sunday when and Jesus' disciples found the empty tomb. We're going to go back 33 years because every Easter, when we celebrate that he's risen, I... I always go back to this moment in time when there's this nice, happy family. This newly married couple who had just had a little baby boy who were traveling to Jerusalem to, to see the, the, the things that they had to be done according to the law and the temple. And, and, and it's this nice, joyous occasion. It's a holiday. And and Joseph and Mary are traveling to the temple to present Jesus to the Lord. I think of the proud dad that Joseph was, even though I was complicated. I think of the, the, the proud and, and awesome feelings that Mary had as she held her baby boy in her arms as she went to the temple. The, the joys of being a mom and of seeing Jesus healthy. And then they, they come across this old prophet who has waited years to see the fruition of God's promise. That he would not die until he saw, till he set eyes on the Lord's Messiah. Mary and Joseph, new parents full of hope and happiness. A prophet full of joy at what he witnesses. And, and it's amazing. I think it's this joyous and celebratory occasion. They're happy. Everybody's happy. But then in the midst of this joyous time enters the hard words of pain. Simeon's words for Mary, a sword will pierce your soul. That's imagery that's very powerful. And it isn't a small thing. Mary has been chosen for a singular honor. An amazing and wonderful gift has been given to her. But in the midst of that gift, a sword will pierce her soul. And that's what she has experienced. She stood before the cross... And watched her son die. She watched him heave and groan and suffer, unable to stop it. Powerless to change what was happening. Can, can you imagine that? Like, I want us to give a full picture. She's standing there watching her son, her firstborn, die, and she can do nothing. Standing there as the Roman oppressors put her son to death. Standing there as, as the ones that she was supposed to be able to trust, the, the religious officials sold him out. Because they were so caught up in their own power and their own prestige. They were, they were jealous over him and so they sold him out. And as she stands there, she can do nothing. Agony, anger, hopelessness, pain, sorrow. A sword has pierced her soul. Have you ever been in a place like that? Have you ever felt hopelessness, powerlessness, pain and agony over something you cannot change, pain and sorrow on top of pain and sorrow? If we live long enough, odds are we will face Something like that. That's the promise of life. It's, it's, we see it in Scripture. We see it just in our everyday experiences. 
Our days will be full of really good days. Our days will be full of okay days. Our days will be full of bad days. And our days will be full of really, really bad days. Scripture teaches this this truth. That in this world, we will have trouble. Christians believe that the greatest thing that has ever happened was experienced on Easter morning a little over 2,000 years ago. That when, Jesus, when some of Jesus' friends came to the t- tomb and found it empty, that Jesus was gone. And in fear and trembling, as we read in Mark, they wandered away, not realizing the implications of what it meant. But what they learned on that morning and the days following changed their lives And it continues to change our lives today. The good of Easter follows the sorrow and pain three days earlier. The sword that pierced a soul. In the deepest and darkest despair, in the midst of agony, the truth of the world is seen. And it's found not absent of pain and darkness, but in the midst of it. Modern strategy for pain is to avoid it at all costs. We don't want it, so we avoid it. In fact, you may be sitting here going, man, this is Easter morning, Pastor Mark. Why are you being so heavy? It's because we don't like to think about it. We don't like, we avoid pain. We, we pursue pleasure over pain. We brew and create concoctions and drugs to keep us from feeling pain and sorrow we refuse to have hard conversations we avoid conflict we go along to get along we hedge our bets we take out insurance we do risk analysis and we live we live our lives trying to react to the circumstances in which we find ourselves to minimize pain we live in fear worried about the what if of things that may or may not happen And so we live with an attitude, if you were here on Friday when Joel said, we live with an attitude of, you just got to do what's best for you. We measure life by what is best for us. But life is more than what's best for us. If we focus on our circumstances, then we are constantly at the whim of powers and people around us. And our life becomes a roller coaster up and down and up and down. We become slaves to our feelings, slaves to our desires of the moment, to the things around us. But the promise of Jesus is rest for our weary souls, freedom from slavery, hope when we are hopeless. Easter Sunday is a reminder and a practice for how we can do that. As we look at Hannah's prayer this morning, her song that she sings, it gives us hope. I think it gives us very practical how. That if you are weary, if you feel trapped by repeating powers of of self-destruction or or. or patterns of self-destruction if you need hope that this song that Hannah sings can show us how it gives us the theological foundation the underpinning that the proof of Easter shows us he has risen it's more than just empty words we speak it's more than just lip service or a greeting on a specific time of year it is proof that what Hannah sings in first Samuel is true and real and we can align our hearts and our lives to that it's a perfect song for easter it's a song that should burst from our lips a song that should carry our hearts and our minds through the twisty and dark corridors of our life until nothing else distracts us or carries us away my daughter learns songs at her school and they're christian songs and she, she learns them a, a bunch of different songs. She knows more than I even realize that she knows. But a few weeks ago, I was, I was in the house, and I could hear her singing, and she does that. She sings pretty often to herself, and 
A lot of times it's made up songs that she just kind of sings kind of uh, free verse and stream of conscience so they can go anywhere. And usually I tune them out, but on this day she was singing and, and it, the tune kind of sounded familiar. And I was, so I kind of snuck around because she's in playing with her dolls all by herself. And I just hear her singing, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on the Lord. And I'm listening to her, and she's singing that to herself. She, nobody else is around. It's just her and the Lord and her baby dolls. And, I, and, and I'm like, I start singing it with her. And she turns around, and she looks at me like, how in the world do you, like, how do you know that song? And I'm like, we sing that at, we sing that at church. And she goes, no, we sing that at my school. But that song is in her heart. My hope is that this song the song that Hannah sings is in our heart, that it's sunk deep, that it's like it grabs our heart and it holds on and you can't let go of it. And it just repeats over and over and over again. In the highs, in the lows, and in between. So I want to paint a picture of Hannah's life for just a minute. She wanted a child so bad. She longed for it. Nothing else could make her happy or give her pleasure. It overwhelmed her each and every day, so much so that when she was at the temple, she began to pray to the Lord that he would give her this one heart's desire, that he would give her a child. And her prayer was so powerful, so emotional. She was so carried away in praying to the Lord. That Eli sees her, the priest sees her, and he goes, man, this girl's been drinking. And he says, woman, don't, why are you drinking? Don't, you should stop drinking. And she says, I'm, I'm not drinking. I'm just so, I need the Lord so badly to answer this prayer. I want a child. She wanted a child so bad her soul was hurting. Her life was dark and depressed. And as the story goes, God answered her prayer. He gave her a child, Samuel. And she sang this song, the one that we're looking at today, as she dedicated him to the temple because he was going to spend the rest of his life serving the Lord in the temple. It was full of truths that she had found in the dark valley that she'd been in and now burst forth as she stood on the high mountain of joy. And she can look back to her pain and sorrow and share with us the truths that carried her through. And this is what we look at this morning. And there's three truths that I think she kind of pulls out in this song. The first is in verses 1 and 2. Her heart rejoices in the Lord. Apart from his answer to her prayers, apart from anything else, her heart rejoices in the Lord. And she says there's no rock like our God. Now this is a massive truth in Scripture. There is no rock like our God. There is no one in which we should have hope like God. There's nothing that can bring true happiness, true focus like God, our rock. Not the child that she so desperately wants, but God. Jesus taught a parable about a man who built his house on the rock in Matthew 7. And it wasn't a practical guide on how to build a better house. It's a deeper truth. And what does Jesus mean by building our house on the rock? Or, or sometimes we'll say, you just got to put your eyes on Jesus. Or you just got to look to Jesus. Or you got to look to the Lord. And what do we mean by that? Well, it's, it's in Jesus' parable. Matthew 7, 24. To look to God or to fix your eyes on Jesus is to listen to him. Therefore, anyone who hears the words of Jesus and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Do the things that Jesus clearly and plainly lays out, and that's a good start. I wish I could say if you do that, all the days of your life that it will ease your pain or you won't feel pain ever or you'll never go through a dark valley or a dark time. 
But odds are, actually, if you listen to Jesus, you may go through times that you wouldn't have gone through before. I remember early on in my marriage with my wife, she called me, and I can always tell sometimes, always sometimes, I can always tell when she's a little nervous that I'm going to be mad because she goes, um, I did something today. And I'm like, okay, what did you do today? And she says, there was this lady that I gave money to who was asking for money. And we were young and married, newly married, and we didn't have a whole lot of money. And I'm like, okay, no big deal. How much did you give her? And she told me how much she gave her. And in my mind, I like, something broke. Because I'm like, I could think of a million things that I could have spent that money on. And I'm trying to be cool because I don't want to be a harsh husband. So I'm like, oh, okay. And then she goes, she just says, Jesus told me to. Which you don't have an answer to that. But now I'm, I'm in this predicament to try to figure out, like, this feeling that I have that I'm kind of angry that she gave money. But I know that in my heart that it's the right thing to do. And there's this battle that takes place. And that's because somebody was trying to follow Jesus. It's the same war you will face. I'm not, not just with money, but it's the same war you will face in every situation. When vengeance would feel so good. And it does in that moment. But Jesus calls you to love your enemy. And forgive. When pleasure feels so good. Jesus calls for faithfulness. When lying would make things so easy. Jesus calls for truth. When keeping resources makes you feel so secure, and Jesus calls for generosity. He is the one who weighs our deeds, as we see in verse 3. But he's also the God who changes our circumstances, as we see in verses 3 through 8. And Hannah moves into another truth that's so important, and that is circumstances can change. The strong are humbled, the weak are made strong. Those who had plenty, who were full of food, find themselves in need and they have to hire themselves out. The one whose heart's desire is so far away that they wanted children, they are now given to them. And the one who had all they wanted and desired found themselves dry. The Lord raises up. He sends down. He brings poverty and wealth and all things. In other words, God is sovereign and in control. God knows all things. And he has the power to change all things. And he acts to do what is best. And we may never know why. That is one of the most important things that a person can learn. It's maybe one of the hardest things a person can learn. It's one of the hardest things to understand. But it's a truth of Scripture that, even when we don't understand, is truth. Hannah frames it by warning us not to speak arrogance, not to be proud. In other words, don't puff yourself up because things are going well. It's like someone who brags or is proud about being tall. They ultimately have no responsibility for that decision. It makes no sense to brag if you're tall because that was God, clearly. But we make the mistakes of just thinking that that's true of just things like genetics. Things like that, but it applies to everything. It applies to all of life. He sends poverty and wealth. He brings death and he brings life. He raises the poor and he humbles and he exalts. This is the key. And when we truly believe this, when we truly kind of start wrapping our mind around this, it begins to shift our perspective. If we are high, if things are going good, if we are successful, then we don't get too puffed up. Because it's not us, it's God. We cannot take all the credit for where we are. Yeah, you may have worked hard you may have worked your booty off to get to where you are and we may think it's all because of our character or our hard work but who gave you the experiences that built you into what you have become god he orchestrated it and you can't take pride
But you can do a couple things. You can be thankful. You can praise God for what he has done in your life. But you cannot begin to think that it's because of your awesomeness. And it reshapes how you see the world. It reorients yourself to others. You aren't any better. You aren't any worse. And on the flip side, if you are low, if you are not doing well, if you find you're on the other side of that equation and you don't feel like you've been blessed, if you are in a season of pain and sorrow, a focus on God and not your circumstances can shift things. It can keep you from becoming bitter. God gives good things to his people, and that is a truth that's in Scripture. So it changes your perspective. If you are his people, therefore what good things has he given to you in that time of trouble? It gives you two questions to ask. What good can come from this? That's a hard question to ask. But also the second question is what good is still here as I go through this? A little easier of a question, maybe. And it gives you hope because God can change it. He can flip it just as quick as he put you in that situation. And when you focus on him as the provider and the helper, you can find hope. And you can ask the question, how can I respond to him? How can I see what he's doing in the midst of this? And we have patterns for that all through Scripture. The Psalms give us patterns. Job gives us patterns. Lamentations give us patterns. Philippians 4, Paul says that he's found the secret of being content. In the highs and lows of life, he has found the secret to being content. And you wait for that secret. You read through Philippians 4 and you look for that secret. And you think, man, this must be really good. It must be complex. It must be tricky. i gotta, I got to figure it out. But it's just simply this, that... No matter if he's high or low, his eyes are on God, and he knows that God is with him and carries him through. When I went into the Marine Corps boot camp, one of the things we had to learn to do was land navigation. We were taught to use a compass and a map. This was way before GPSs, just to, you know, date myself. But we had to learn a compass and a map. And they gave us this test where they sent us out in the woods, you had to find different points on the, in the, this area that were hidden. And they gave you grit, map coordinates and a, a compass and said, go do it. And one of the things that I learned as I navigated in the woods is that if I found a landmark that was easily seen and set my eyes upon that landmark, no matter what happened, if I fell in a swamp, which I might have done, if I fell down a hill, probably I did that, if I got turned around, That if I had a good enough landmark, then it didn't matter what was happening around me. I could fix my eyes on that one thing and find my way every time. God is that one thing. No matter what happens around us, He is the one thing that will always keep you in the right direction. Through every circumstance and situation, and in the moment, it's so hard to believe if you haven't already made the decision to keep your, your eyes focused on Him. I want to read these last two verses of this song. If you have zoomed out, if you've zoned out, if you hear nothing else today, you need to zone back in on this one. Just stick with me for a couple of minutes. We're almost done. Verses 9 and 10. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. It isn't through strength that one prevails. 
It is and always has been only through God that you can prevail, no matter what it looks like. At this point, you may be thinking the whole point of the sermon is this. Keep your eyes focused on God. Do what he says no matter what, and he will see the good that you do, and he will change your circumstances. So in the good, stay focused on him. In the bad, stay focused on him. And it is, but it isn't. We should stay focused on him and do what he commands. Those are good, practical applications. But there's something missing in that. If that's the only thing, if you just uh, grit and you just stay focused on him, it takes us back to our problem that we have at the very beginning. It makes our lives and our circumstances dependent upon our own strength. If you think, I can, only, I can do better, I can do harder, I can, I, can, uh, I can just have more faith, then I'll be better. Things will be better. But here's the twist that Hannah's song gives us. It's never from strength that we can prevail. Never from our own effort or willpower. Hannah doesn't say, in my darkest and most trying time, I tried really hard and overcame my barrenness. That wasn't something in her power to do. She laid before God all she needed, all she wanted, and she trusted him. The beauty of this song is that it began to form in her heart before God ever answered her prayer. If you go back to, the, to chapter 1, verse 18, she's talking to the priest, Eli. She says, may your servant find favor in your eyes after she's told him uh, what her prayer is. And then we're, we're told this, then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. She begins to move out of her depression and sadness before God answers her prayer. She learns something here. Something happened as she was in that temple praying. She learned that she could trust God, that no matter her situation, she can trust Him. And in that last verse of her song, she sings a prophecy. Those, verse 10, those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. I like the Hebrew better here. God will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his Messiah. That is Easter. The pain and sorrow of the day is broken when God gives strength and exalts Jesus by raising him from the dead and emptying out the tomb. You see, we can be mistaken to think that there are good days and bad days. That if things are going good, if I have a good job, if I have a good place to live, family and friends who care about me, everyone is healthy, that if things are going well, then things should be good. But the Bible tells us something important about life. That every day, apart from God, separate from God, is a dark day, is a bad day. That without God, our lives are lives of corruption and darkness. And we cannot possibly hope to see our way out without God's mercy. Every day we are the ones in verse 10 who God oppose and who will be broken. We are the ones who will be judged except for the one who stands between us and that judgment. We cannot in our own strength pull ourselves out but Jesus can he did he faced the punishment we deserve on the cross so that we could find delight in his deliverance 
so that we could trust him the same way that Hannah trusted him. And the empty tomb is proof of that truth. The ins and outs of life will take us in so many different directions, but we can look to the empty tomb and the love of God in Christ as a God. As Hebrews 11 says, God rewards those who seek him. And Jesus says in John 16 that we will face trouble, but in him, you and I will have peace. Do you want peace? Do you want hope? Do you want more? It's found in the risen Christ. If you don't start there, you will never find it. You can search all your life and you can find things that may make you happy. You may find things that may make you feel like things are going well and good. But you will never find that true peace, that true hope. All you have to do is turn to him and say yes. And you will find that same kind of song that Hannah sings. And it will go deep into your heart. Let's pray. Lord, help us to find that peace and that hope that you give. Help us to say yes to you if we've never have before. Help us look to the empty tomb and believe and trust in your goodness for us even when we suffer, even when we go through hard times. Help us to look to you in the same way Paul can to shape our contentment and our happiness. Give us a deep and abiding joy in you and you alone so that we are never moved, so we don't go through the ups and downs. We praise you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.